Have you ever had to fire or let go or remove your star player in the middle of a game? Listen, as a project manager, I've faced the exact situation. But here's the kicker. Sometimes it's not about individuals. I've had to pull the plug on entire projects that were months, and I do mean months, in the making. What's the most gut-wrenching decision you have ever had to make in your professional career? And more importantly, how did you find the courage to follow through? In today's episode, I'm breaking down eight, I do mean eight of the toughest calls I've had to make in my decade as a project manager. And trust me, number six, we. This is that one right there that you are going to really want to pay attention to because it will have, it would definitely rethink, have you rethink everything you know about leadership. So stay tuned because these insights might just save your next project or career. You mind if I share a story with you? You know, family, when I got into this thing that I love that I hope you fall in love with called project management, one of the things that I wasn't aware of was making tough decisions. See, one thing about making tough decisions is, is that a lot of people make choices when they're leading their projects and not make decisions. See, I made the decision to actually implement a particular solution. And what it was happening is, is that we had a go, no, go call. And the main resource that we needed there to really confirm that, hey, we, uh, the leader that was supposed to be there just didn't show up. I emailed the, the leader. I pinged the uh, leader in um, chat. No responses. So we got on the call around midnight to get ready to implement the change. The team said, hey, are we a go? And I said, hey, I want to tell you this has been a great opportunity working with you guys. I'm super excited for what we're about to do, but I will inform you guys. Um, I'm making this decision based on the feedback I've received from you guys, the data that I looked at, because we didn't get an approval, even though I sent an email, I did, you guys recall the go, no go call. I just need to know, are you with me? And they'd say, yeah, we with you, Ed. So it was, uh, I said, let's go. And they implemented the change. The change went amazingly well. And later, after the change ended, I got an email because I sent that email at the leader um, responded to the email, said, hey, great job, Ed and team. And I was like, this is strange. So the next, the, the, uh, the leader reached out to me and said, hey, do you have a moment to chat? I was like, you know, at first I was like, no, I really don't want to talk to you because when I needed you, you didn't show up there. But I put my pride, my emotions aside, and I said, absolutely. And one thing I will say, family, I'm glad I did. And a lot of times you're going to run into to stakeholders like this where you're going to need to put your pride and emotions aside and have those tough conversations because I needed to have this conversation with him. And so as soon as, as, soon as I, I, I talked with him, he was saying, hey, I want to commend you. He said, most project managers wouldn't have made the decision that you made. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, we put you in that position to make those tough decisions. Yes, I understand that you were looking for my sign off and, and everything, but you've done the same thing that I would have done. And, you know, first of all, looked at the data, talked with the, the subject matter experts, had a go, no go call, for, or put a plan A, B, and C in place, meaning that if it didn't go well, this was our plan A. If plan A didn't work, plan B and X. So, uh, I wanted to see how you were going to respond. I always had your back at somebody else uh, from my team on those calls, as you're aware of. And I just want to commend you for having the courage to do that. Why do I share that story with you? I share that story with you, family, because of land. Um, you're hired to make these tough decisions. You're hired. This is why I, sometimes I would get irritated because I've been through tough decisions like this many times over and over. And what someone would do is they would come to you with a problem and never a proposed solution. They, again, let me slow that down. It may have missed you. I said, they will come to you with problem after problem after problem, but they will not give you a proposed solution. And when you're in this thing that I love, that I hope you fall in love with called project management, you need to be able to be able to come up with a solution, even if the solution makes no sense, because at least that leader knows that they don't have to do all the thinking for you. Now let's jump into point number one. 
Point number one, removing a key team member from a mid pro uh, team member at mid project. What happened family is I, I had a senior developer on my team and they were truly under four, uh, underperforming. And I, I had rule. Uh, this is something that I've made up along the journey is that I will give you two conversations and max three conversations, one-on-one, -on -one, not in front of the team. My goal is not to embarrass you in front of the team. And after that second to maybe if, if we need to have that third conversation and I have not seen a change I, and I've seen that you really just, um, try to manipulate the situation, I will take the next step in the escalation path, which would be talking to their direct manager. If I don't, um, course correction from their, from their manager, I'm skipping to the top of the level, meaning I'm going straight to the CIO or the CISO, depending on which type of project I'm leading. I, I don't have time to play. If you're going to play with that, with this project, I'm going to let you know how serious I am. And as soon as the CIO or a CISO gets involved, the first thing they're going to ask me is, Ed, what did you do to try to first course correct it? I, I'll say I had two to three meetings with this individual. Here's the document notes that we discussed. And I also sent an email information of what we agreed on and what, what the changes were going to be. After that, I went to their manager. Their manager was wanted to create no sense of urgency and talk with the resource. So I came directly to you. Hey, Ed, thank you for your time. You may leave. And I just leave it at that. And next thing I know, I'll get another resource or we'll make it work. So family, I'm saying all that to say this. You want to do what? Documentation beats conversation. Have thorough documentation. So when you're making this difficult decision, that you can have the documentation to support you, not the emotions. Let's move on to point number two, recommending project cancellation to stakeholders. You know, one of the things you have to understand, sometimes when you're leading a project, especially in a predictive style, I'm not talking about adaptive where you can run a scrub framework. I'm talking about a waterfall approach. Market conditions may change quickly and dramatically, and you may need to pivot. And if you have to pivot, this project that you're leading will probably not even make sense anymore. And you need to be able to document that properly and then put the start recommending how you're going to cancel this project so you can shift and make the proper decision in the best interest of the organization. Remember, as a project manager, the, when you're leading projects, you're leading projects in the best interest of the organization or basically the sponsor, which is a representation of the organization. Let's move on to point number three, replacing a vendor mid project. Oh man, let me tell you a short story about this. I don't know how many times this happened to me and it had got to a point where I had to read a, uh, a vendor and it was, it, it, I knew it was going to jeopardize the entire project, but I had to replace it. They weren't, they weren't at delivering the product on time. The customer service was horrible. Uh, the account executive was not attending the meeting so we can get updates so where we're at, so we can be aligned on, on both of our, our project schedules. So once I started seeing some of these red flags, I didn't wait for it to continue to get worse. I contacted legal. I brought the contract to legal and I said, Hey, I need you to help me. Uh, I'm going to show you what I think I found in the contract that we can either buy our way out, or we may be able to get this because of. Um, they didn't fulfill their timelines as per the contract. And yes, this may be a short term setback, but I'd rather have a short term setback than an entire project just fail completely because the vendor has made a decision not to actually live up to their, to their end of the bar bargain. And if you have a, a, a superior or an exceptional legal team, what they'll tell you is, Hey, give us, let us, let us walk through the contract. You go ahead and start looking. Uh, put an RFP out there or either RFI, again, RFP request for a proposal or RFI request for information and start looking for a contractor and see if I've met there in the, uh, on this project. And again, family, don't hesitate to make this tough decision because they will know when a vendor is underperforming because they, the, the contractor has this, I mean, excuse me, the vendor has the same authority. If they feel like they're asking things of you and you're not delivering, they could probably, they have the right contractually to say, Hey, well, we're going to terminate this contract because it's not beneficial to neither one of us. Let's move on to point number four, delaying a product launch, despite pressures from sales. I come from a, a, a sales background and so I get both sides of the business. Uh, however, what, what tends to happen and 
some of these sales calls be to, to retain or obtain business. What will happen is uh, salespeople will just over deliver or excuse me, over promise things and not deliver on the dates that to the clients that they promised. And so what I had to start doing was talking with these sales teams and say, hey, we need to stop doing that because what ends up happening is if we can continue to, if we keep doing that the same way, number one, it's going to be to our product, uh, which is an impact, basically an impact to the quality, as well as an impact to our, reputa our reputation, as well as all, of, this is not doing anything, you know, long-term, all we're getting is short-term gains. So why not deliver a better product? And yeah, our reputation may take a slight little hit, but it won't take the major hit if you continue, if you told them. Hey, you're going to get it in X amount of months. And we already told you that it's going to take 12 months instead of 10 months. And you're telling them in 10 months and you're trying to put pressure on the project team and they won't be able to deliver because of the fact they have to do the testing. You're fully aware of this. So you have to be willing to push back and have the, and have the receipts, as they will say, or what we like to say, documentation. Let's move on to point number five, overruling a senior technical expert's recommendation. Hey, I had to push back on a lead architect because of the fact of uh, the solution that they insisted on was complex and a cutting edge solution. But I believe that that really wasn't necessary for based on the scope that we had. So I basically started having intense discussions and having second opinions to figure out if this, what this lead architect was going with or the decision that they've made which one would be more stable and where we're currently at. We can always go back and renegotiate with the customer to build this cutting edge solution. Now we, but we need to meet uh, the customer where they're at and then eventually bring them up. And yeah, I'm going to be honest, the late architect didn't appreciate that. Again, I have to do what's in best interest of the organization and I need to trust my judgment and not be afraid to, to, to challenge experts even though they have more experience than me, they know the technology inside and out. However, I know what's best for the customer based on what, when we built out the scope in the cutting edge solution was nowhere near the uh, scope. Let's move on to point number six. This is the one I, I really believe you should be waiting on. And that's revealing a major project set up, uh, set back to the executive team. You know, family, when you are leading projects, what's going to happen is you're going to have resources uh, I should say project team members, as well as stakeholders that are not going to show up to the meetings. And, and one day I just got frustrated. I was like, you guys are not showing up to the meetings. Uh, I'm sending out the meeting recaps. There's no type of interaction there. I'm pinging you and teams to say, Hey, I really need you guys here. And so finally, I, I don't know. It must've got back to the CEO it was like, Hey, um, fuck. I want you to come present your project uh, to, to me and the executive team. I said, no problem. So I, I called another meeting. I said, hey, guys, this meeting, everyone showed up. I said, listen, we're going to have to, pre I'm, I'm going to have to present to the executive team. And I'm not going to lie about where we're at. I'm not going to hide anything. I'm going to be very transparent. So you need to get ready for the questions. You need to start preparing and we can be ready. I've done everything possible to try to protect you guys. And uh, unfortunately, what I've been doing hasn't worked well. And so we're going to go in front of leadership team and we're going to have a transparent conversation about the significant issues. And this is going to make everybody uncomfortable. But as a project manager, you sometimes need to make these tough decisions, even though it's, it's, it's not popular uh, with on the team, but you've given them opportunities to course correct and they chose not to. Let's move on to point number seven, enforcing unpopular overtime to meet a deadline to get enforcing unpopular to meet a deadline. Uh, there was a situation that I actually had where we made an implementation and if this was, we started and it went to a body about, uh, I think it was like six o'clock in the morning. And I probably laid down maybe 30 minutes at tops and I got a call and then I got to said, Hey, something was raw. Uh, our clients are unable to access their system with the score at all. I'm calling all the, uh, I'm calling all my network engineers. I'm calling, you know, application. And I say, Hey guys, we got to get back on the call. I apologize, but I know you guys are probably either out with your family or probably like me, just getting some rest. And 
that was an uncomfortable call to make to really convince people that don't report it to you that, hey, I need you on this call because if not, we're going to have to, and we're already going to have to escalate this up to executives and they're going to want to plan and what we're going to do. So I need everybody to get on the call and we got on the call and we got the, the situation, you know, resolved, but that was a very long day. I'll tell you, and I probably slept the next day, just probably half of the day. Cause it was one of those things where you can only control the controllables and we miss thing that wasn't provided to us and we could point the finger and say, well, we would have known if we would have known about that, this wouldn't have happened. Well, it happened. So now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit down there and continue to complain or be frustrated or are you going to take action? Let's move on to point number eight, splitting up a project team. You know, one of the things I've learned in this thing called project management is, is that when you have two separate teams going at the same time, you have to look for red flags if they're not uh, collaborating well. And right away, you need to cut. You need decision to split this team up. Uh, quick story. I actually did do that at first and I paid for it. And eventually I said, you know what? I, I'm, I'm tired of playing because every time we get on the call, it would be the same two leaders going back and forth. So what I did was I split I split up the teams. And when it was time to present to the, the CIO, that's when each other found out about their their particular outputs. Because I got tired of of them going back and forth, and I was also getting messages from other team member, other uh, project team members, just like, you know, I'm tired of going joining these calls, and all they do is disrupt these calls. And I said, "Yep, you're right. I'm going to do something about it." And I did. When I separated two, again, they didn't like it. Uh, excuse me, not their two, but their to t- uh, their two teams. What they uh, what ended up happening though, the, the meetings ran better. All right. Uh, two bonuses and then I'll end with those remarks. Allocating resources to pick, uh, fix technical debt over new features. My developer, my application developers, I have a sense to really get bogged down with uh, putting on new features and showing this could really improve uh, the whole overall application and check this out and look at this. And I'm like, hey, that's amazing. Look at our scope. This is what the customer asked for. We need to do that. We need to fix the issues that are on hand before we even think about any new features. Because if you start adding on new features and the customer, number one, didn't ask for it. And number two, we didn't give them what they originally wanted. We really, we, we didn't fulfill our end of the track. So again, we need to fix these, uh, these technical issues. And then we can think about looking at new, new features. Let's move on to the last and final bonus here, implementing a a controversial change management process. What I mean by that is, is that, um, I've been in organizations, most of the organizations I've been in, they have had a change management process, but sometimes it has a way of (laughs) saying, you know, we don't need to go through the change management process. And what I've, what I've had to do is really hold them accountable and responsible because what I don't, because I've actually seen it happen where uh, a resource makes a change and it disrupts something else. And then we're held accountable for not following the proper processes and procedures. And all we had to do was go through change management and we would have discovered that, hey, we're making this change. Oh, it may impact another group. And so what I realized when I started seeing that happen, I stopped that. I nipped that right in the bud right away. I said, listen, we will not, we will not operate here. I do not want to be part of a project that moves like that because what will happen is, is that again, if something goes wrong, we all can lose our, our job. So to, to help that out, let's make sure we're documenting prop, uh, properly and going through the change management process. I only have two calls and remarks on my way. First one is removing key, uh, uh, team members mid project. Listen, you may have to make these tough decisions, but like I said, do the do the three one two to three one on ones. Talk to their direct manager after that, and then just escalate. Point number two: delaying product launches despite pressure from sales. Your sales team may have over promised and said that we were going to over deliver on something. You need to have a very transparent conversation first. Course correct what they when they what they said originally and tell them. You need to stop doing that because if you continue to do that, you're going to continue to impact the organization's reputation, as well as you're going to have us delivering a product that is not of quality 
which we're going to start losing customers. Family, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. 